The Occupational and Environmental Health Foundation presents An Introduction to Occupational and Environmental Medicine. I'm Dr. John O'Neill, the Residency Director. And I'm Dr. Pamela Summers, Chief Resident at the Health Partners and University of Minnesota Occupational and Environmental Medicine Program in St. Paul, Minnesota. Many people have never heard of our medical specialty, so we're going to introduce you to this dynamic field. What is occupational medicine? Occupational medicine is defined as a medical specialty that deals with the prevention and treatment of injuries and illnesses in workers. What is environmental medicine? Environmental medicine deals with the prevention and treatment of injuries and illnesses caused by exposures outside of the workplace. A key word here is exposure. If the exposure was in the workplace, it's called occupational. If the exposure was outside the workplace, it's called environmental. Approximately 5,500 people are killed at work each year in the United States. About 40% of those deaths are due to transportation incidents, such as truck, car, and plane crashes. About 18% are due to contact with objects, 16% due to assaults, 13% due to falls, and 9% due to exposure to harmful substances or environments. About 93% of all people killed at work are men, mainly because more men work in dangerous jobs, such as construction, fishing, farming, mining, and transportation. Between 3.5 and 4 million people per year are reported to have work-related injuries or illnesses. Many of these problems are not reported or recognized, so these numbers may be greatly underestimated. About 95% of the reported problems are injuries, and 5% are illnesses. About half of all occupational injuries are musculoskeletal, involving muscles, bones, tendons, and joints. Unfortunately, thousands of people each year develop illnesses such as cancer or lung problems that are caused by their work, but do not have symptoms until years after their exposures. Because of underreporting, non-recognition, and long lag times between exposures and onset of problems, the true number of work-related illnesses and injuries in the United States is unknown. Over 2,000 years ago, Hippocrates wrote about the poor working conditions and health problems of miners, metal workers, dye workers, farmers, tailors, and horsemen. About 500 years later, Pliny the Elder wrote about fumes from silver mines being harmful to animals and that sulfur and alum fumes killed workers in mines. Unfortunately, his curiosity took him too close to Pompeii, where he was killed by toxic gases from the volcanic eruption of Mount Vesuvius. The modern father of occupational medicine is considered to be the Italian Bernardino Ramazzini, who in 1700 described work-related illnesses in many jobs and advocated for workers to have periods of rest, changes of posture, adequate ventilation, and hand washing. Unfortunately, Ramazzini's work wasn't translated into English until 1940. Ramazzini said this about medical history taking. To the questions recommended by Hippocrates, he should ask one more. What is your occupation? Alas, medical students and residents get very little or no training in occupational or environmental history taking. In 1775, Sir Percival Pott described cases of scrotal cancer in chimney sweeps. Almost 200 years later, the cause would be identified as coal tar, pitch, and shale oil from the ash that accumulated in the chimney sweeps' groin areas as they pulled their brooms up and down guided by their legs. 
These same burnt substances are now known to be associated with smoking and lung cancer. The modern mother of occupational medicine is Dr. Alice Hamilton. Dr. Hamilton was the first female faculty member at Harvard in any field and was the first physician in the United States to dedicate her or his life to occupational medicine. She studied the effects of lead, phosphorus, carbon monoxide, nitroglycerin, mercury, vibration, and benzene on workers. In 1996, the U.S. Postal Service issued a stamp commemorating the achievements of Dr. Hamilton. The American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine, or ACOM, is the largest medical society in the United States dedicated to promoting the health of workers through preventive medicine, clinical care, education, and research. ACOM members are knowledgeable and capable of treating job-related diseases, recognizing and resolving workplace hazards, instituting rehabilitation methods, and providing well-managed care. The continual emergence of new chemicals, complex tools, manufacturing methodologies, pollution and environmental impacting activities, as well as healthcare reform, has focused and mandated the need for trained occupational and environmental medicine specialists. You can find out more about ACOM by visiting our website at www.acom.org. Formal residency training occurs at one of only about 25 accredited occupational and environmental medicine residency programs in the U.S. Training in these residencies starts during the postgraduate year two, which means that doctors starting our programs have already completed an internship in another medical specialty, such as family medicine, internal medicine, surgery, or they might have done a transitional internship. During the two-year program, residents complete a research project they get a graduate degree in public health, usually an MPH, Master's of Public Health. They perform clinical rotations, and they might rotate at federal and local public health agencies. We're, We're residents, and we love occupational medicine. Once residents graduate from an accredited residency program, they apply to become boarded. Board certification is granted by the American Board of Preventive Medicine. Preventive medicine focuses on the health of individuals, communities, and defined populations. Its goal is to protect, promote, and maintain health and well-being, and to prevent disease, disability, and death. Preventive medicine has three specialty areas that emphasize different populations, environments, or practice settings. Public health and general preventive medicine, aerospace medicine, and occupational medicine. I went into corporate occupational medicine because I can actively help people to live and enjoy their lives to the fullest. People should be able to go home in the evening as healthy as they came to work in the morning. Some of the unique things we deal with in occupational medicine are the various exposures our patients have in the workplace. Evaluation of exposures has two parts, agent and route. Agents include metals, chemicals, infectious, such as hepatitis or tuberculosis, physical, such as heat, noise, radiation, or force, and organic, such as oxygen or water. Routes of exposure include inhalation, dermal, ingestion, ocular, and acoustic. For example, a farmer might be exposed to physical agents, such as excessive sunlight, which could cause skin cancer, or excessive cold, which could cause frostbite, or excessive force during your tractor rollover. As a preventive medicine specialist, I'd much rather prevent these problems by encouraging the farmer to avoid excessive sunlight, cover exposed areas, avoid excessive cold temperatures, and wear warm clothes, and make sure all tractors have rollover bars. A farmer might also be exposed to chemicals, such as pesticides, that could be inhaled, ingested, or absorbed through the skin, causing significant systemic symptoms. A bartender might be exposed to the physical agent of noise, the organic agent water, and cigarette smoke, which could cause decreased hearing, slips and falls, and allergies or lung cancer. A nurse could be exposed to excessive force lifting a patient, resulting in low back pain, blood from a needle stick, resulting in hepatitis, or influenza from a sick patient. 
An assembly line worker might be exposed to excessive noise from machinery, excessive physical movement, and force or trauma from the machine itself. A construction worker could be exposed to heat, cold, rain, noise, force, and vibration. Unfortunately, construction workers sometimes fall from buildings or are hit by objects during construction. Five workers died during the construction of the Empire State Building and 11 workers died during the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge. In 1910, it was estimated that over 2 million children under age 15 worked in industrial jobs. The photographer Lewis Hines documented many of these young workers. Many young girls worked in factories, while many young boys worked in coal mines. Boys were valued as coal miners because their small bodies and hands could get far into parts of the mines where adults could not reach. The publication of Hines' powerful photographs of the exploitation of American children was a major force in motivating states and the U.S. Congress to pass laws forbidding underage employment. In New York City in 1911, 146 workers, mostly teenage immigrant girls, died in a fire at the Triangle Shirtwaist Company. Many were burned, but many jumped to their deaths to avoid the flames. The small interior fire escape was cut off by flames, and the other exit doors may have been deliberately locked so that workers couldn't steal material. The fire ladders were several stories too short for the tall building, and the workers had the choice of being burned or jumping. This tragedy was a catalyst for political reform in New York State and the rest of the country, resulting in the passage of the first workers' compensation laws in 1911. Each state has its own set of workers' compensation laws. In general, these laws have two main sections. First, they pay for medical care and rehabilitation of workers injured on the job or made ill from their work. Second, they provide compensation to the worker for lost wages, called indemnity costs. The current cost of workers' compensation in the United States is estimated to be over $100 billion a year. In a theoretical sense, treating an injured worker is a failure of a preventive occupational medicine program. But work-related injuries do occur. One of the truly unique and interesting aspects of occupational medicine is that it's not just a doctor in a straight-line relationship working with a patient. It's really a triangle the doctor working with the employee and the employer. This also adds the employer working with the employee, relating to modified duty, lost wages, and return to work issues. So in occupational medicine, it's a doctor and an injured worker and maybe a supervisor, a human resources person, a physical or occupational therapist, a nurse case manager, a workers' compensation insurance representative, a health and safety officer, union representative, and maybe a lawyer, but we try to avoid lawyers. Suppose an employee slipped at work in a puddle of water and twisted her ankle. Standard injury treatment might include an x-ray, ice, an ankle brace, crutches, and a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicine such as ibuprofen. The treatment is relatively simple, but an occupational medicine specialist also thinks about how to prevent the injury. We need to ask, how did the accident happen? So where did this puddle of water come from? It came from a dripping wet umbrella carried in on a rainy day. So how do we prevent this? Having inexpensive umbrella bags available on a rainy day can prevent employees from slipping and injuring themselves. The occupational medicine provider, the company safety officer, the employee, and the company all work together to come up with a procedural change that makes the workplace safer. In order to prevent workplace injuries, it's incredibly helpful to actually visit the workplace. Especially if the workplace is a refinery, a zoo, or a brewery. 
It's great that this painter is wearing both respiratory protection and goggles, but even this may not prevent an individual who is hypersensitive from developing asthma when exposed to chemicals, such as isocyanates in some paints. It's not just chemicals that can cause work-related asthma. A significant number of bakers, sometimes after years of exposure without problems, develop what's called baker's asthma. Even with full protection, someone who's allergic to bee stings probably shouldn't be working as a beekeeper. This is an important part of occupational medicine, making sure that the job doesn't cause the worker to get ill or injured and that the worker doesn't cause other workers to get ill or injured. Occupational medicine providers perform two types of screening exams to do this, pre-placement examinations and surveillance examinations. An extensive pre-placement examination may not be required for jobs such as routine office or computer work that has few significant exposures. The results of a pre-placement examination must be kept confidential, and the employer has no right to know specific personal medical information about the employee. The occupational medicine provider, after reviewing all information, simply states whether or not the employee can perform the critical functions of the job and if restrictions are necessary. Employers may also require pre-employment drug screening to ensure that the future employee is not currently using illegal drugs. The doctor who reviews government-required drug screening programs is called a medical review officer, or MRO. Occupational medicine doctors are often medical review officers and provide guidance to employers and employees about drug screening at work. Drug use in the workplace is a significant contributing factor to many injuries that occur in the workplace. About 20% of workers who die on the job test positive for illegal drugs or alcohol. Having a well-organized workplace drug screening program is an important part of preventing injuries at work. The second part of a health screening program is called the surveillance exam. A surveillance exam is performed on workers who are already working to make sure that they have not been injured or made ill from exposures in the workplace. For example, workers exposed to hazardous noise should wear hearing protection, but should also have yearly hearing testing. Annual hearing testing can detect early hearing loss often before the worker is even aware of it and allow protective measures to be taken to prevent further hearing loss. Someone routinely exposed to organophosphate pesticides may have annual or even monthly testing to make sure they don't have decreased levels of cholinesterase in their blood, which is an indicator of organophosphate exposure which could cause short and long-term physical damage. Firefighters who may be exposed to smokes and fumes that could damage their lungs normally get annual pulmonary function testing to ensure they don't have small changes in lung function and to ensure they can safely wear self-contained breathing devices. The goal of a surveillance exam is to evaluate if workplace exposures are causing harm to a worker. Of course, decreased pulmonary function testing could be due to smoking, and decreased hearing could be due to listening to loud music and aging. It's the job of the occupational medicine provider to figure out if abnormalities on surveillance exams are caused by work and to prevent further problems if possible. In many jobs that have the potential for dangerous exposures, you have to do these tests in order to be qualified to continue working. The Department of Transportation requires me to have a physical examination every two years to make sure I'm healthy and I can safely drive my truck. The Federal Aviation Administration requires me to have a flight physical every year to make sure I can fly safely. I'm required to get a yearly physical examination and testing, but I'm not sure who requires it. Since some workers may be tearing down old buildings with asbestos in them, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, requires these workers to have an annual physical examination. OSHA was created in 1970 when Congress passed the Occupational Safety Act to assure safe and healthful working conditions for working men and women and it creates and enforces regulations that cover most private workplaces. OSHA tries to make sure that workers do not have hazardous exposures in workplaces. Welders may be exposed to noise, heat, aerosolized metals or fumes, splashes of hot molten metal, and other respirable particulate matter. Welders sometimes develop keratoconjunctivitis, 
or welder's flash. Many workers develop lung problems from breathing in hazardous materials. This is an x-ray of someone with asbestosis. Asbestos, one of the most heat-resistant substances known, was used extensively during the 1940s in naval vessels and other construction. Unfortunately, asbestos fibers get lodged in the lungs and many years later may cause mesothelioma, a cancer of the lining of the lungs. Mesotheliomas may arise 30 or 40 years after exposures, and exposures in the 1940s caused an epidemic of asbestos-related mesotheliomas in the 1970s, which resulted in prohibition of most uses of asbestos in the United States. The long lag time between exposure and development of disease is also the reason that OSHA requires work-related medical records to be kept for 30 years after an employee leaves a job with asbestos or other hazardous exposures. Many different exposures can cause pulmonary complications. Cotton exposure can cause bisonosis. Coal dust can cause black lung disease. Silica can cause silicosis. Brillium can cause chronic brillium disease and many chemicals and substances can cause asthma or other lung problems. It's well known that repetitive forceful movement can cause pain, aching, and injury to the human body. Problems resulting from repetitive movement have been called repetitive motion injuries, repetitive strain injuries, cumulative trauma disorders, overuse syndrome, and the currently accepted term work-related musculoskeletal disorders. These include such problems as tendonitis, tenosynovitis, epicondylitis, carpal tunnel syndrome, bursitis, and sprains and strains. Occupational medicine providers need to know how to treat these work-related musculoskeletal disorders, but just as importantly, we need to know how to prevent them. Ergonomics is the study of the behavior and activities of people working with machines and tools. A quick quiz. Is the preventive goal of ergonomics to fit the worker to the job or fit the job to the worker? The preventive goal should be to fit the job to the worker, which is why workers are most comfortable and have fewer problems if their workspace can be adjusted specifically to their own body size and shape. Chairs, armrests, Keyboards, monitors, telephones, and lighting should be adjusted to the individual worker in order to prevent ergonomic problems, which could cause injury or discomfort, both of which may decrease work productivity and job satisfaction. Productivity is a key word here. Job satisfaction and productivity go hand in hand. Remember the occupational medicine triangle? Now let's look at this from the employer's perspective. I want my employees to be healthy and productive. And that's my goal too, to keep employees healthy and productive. If an employee is made ill or injured, they may become disabled. Being disabled means you cannot do a specific task or activity. Occupational medicine providers are specialists in disability management, which means we understand how to help employees and employers deal with an employee's disability. It's the doctor's job to diagnose and treat an injury, but it's also the doctor's job to say what activities someone can or cannot do safely, whether it's at home or at work. For example, a worker with low back pain, most likely due to a lumbar strain, would be evaluated and might be placed on restrictions such as no lifting more than 10 pounds, no repetitive bending or stooping, and no prolonged walking or standing. Many employers have what's called modified or light duty, which are jobs that can be done if injured workers have specific restrictions. If no appropriate modified duty is available, the employer may send the worker home. You have to know the company, the employee, and the company culture to understand disability management. Yes. Many of us in occupational medicine have time to play golf during daylight hours without beepers. I'm here because employees such as caddies, golf course superintendents, lifeguards, or anyone that works outside for extended periods of time is at risk for skin cancer. It's important to prevent skin damage by making sure these workers wear protective hats and clothing, use sunblock, and avoid excessive sun exposure. 
Workers exposed to wood dust have an increased risk of nasal cancer. Workers exposed to jet fuel have an increased risk of exposure to benzene, which has been associated with leukemia. Workers who perform metal plating may be exposed to hexavalent chromium, which can cause lung cancer. And waitresses, bartenders, and others that work in places that allow cigarette smoking are at increased risk of lung cancer and other breathing disorders associated with secondhand smoke. A radiologist can tell you there's a mass on a chest x-ray. A pathologist can tell you if it's a squamous or basal cell cancer. An oncologist can tell you the options for chemotherapy. A radiation oncologist can tell you about radiation treatment for the tumor. But none of these doctors can tell you what caused the tumor. This is a very important part of occupational medicine, what we call causation determination. Occupational medicine providers are specially trained to help determine if a specific exposure caused a specific illness or disease. In order to prevent an illness, you need to know what caused the illness. So occupational medicine providers are trained in biostatistics and epidemiology. Epidemiology is the study of diseases in populations. Biostatistics is the study of statistics as they apply to the analysis of biological or medical data. We use epidemiologic studies and biostatistics to help us determine if an exposure is associated with a disease, then to help determine if the exposure is causally associated with the disease. For example, there are no good evidence-based studies showing that normal typing at a keyboard causes carpal tunnel syndrome. Certainly, a poor ergonomic design at a workstation can cause discomfort, pain, aches, and strains, but the process of typing is not causally associated with carpal tunnel syndrome. However, repetitive, forceful movements with extreme wrist movement, as might occur here, are causally associated with carpal tunnel syndrome. The risk of developing carpal tunnel syndrome is increased if the worker is overweight, has diabetes, is female, or is pregnant. Many states' workers' compensation programs, however, will consider carpal tunnel compensable if activities at work contribute to or exacerbate some musculoskeletal disorders, including carpal tunnel syndrome. But there are many exposures that we absolutely know cause illnesses or injuries, such as chronic exposure to moderately loud noise or acute exposure to intensely loud noise. Exposures such as noise, heat, cold, water, such as humidity or rain, snow, vibration, radiation, and force are called physical hazards. In the days of early x-rays, radiologists and radiology techs exposed to high amounts of radiation were later found to be at increased risk of leukemias and other cancers. We now provide protection for both employees and patients exposed to diagnostic radiation. In addition to physical and chemical hazards, workers are also exposed to biological hazards such as hepatitis, HIV, tuberculosis, influenza, and if traveling outside the United States, typhoid, malaria, yellow fever, and other hazards. Many occupational medicine providers are also experts in preventive travel medicine as they assess workers that have to travel abroad for their jobs. Biological agents can include poison ivy or any other naturally occurring substance that can cause allergic reactions, whether it's skin, lung, eye, or mucous membrane irritation and damage. Again, thinking prevention, occupational medicine providers try to get workers exposed to these agents to wear what is called personal protective equipment, PPE, such as goggles, masks, respirators, gowns, gloves, and bunny suits. Personal protective equipment varies with the job. And sometimes workers wear protective equipment to protect the workplace from contaminants from the worker. The OSHA Bloodborne Pathogen Standard requires employers to provide personal protective equipment to healthcare and other workers who could potentially be exposed to blood or other body fluids that could be infectious with hepatitis B, hepatitis C, or HIV and requires healthcare workers to be offered hepatitis B vaccination. Unfortunately, the early and frequent use of powdered latex gloves greatly increased the number of healthcare workers who developed work-related latex allergy. Latex and gloves and other medical equipment also puts patients with latex allergy at risk. So many medical facilities now have latex-free crash carts, emergency rooms, 
and surgical suites. Even though the wide use of latex may have contributed to increasing numbers of latex allergies in workers, the rate of work-related hepatitis B infections in healthcare workers has decreased about 98% since OSHA required hepatitis B vaccination and the use of personal protective equipment when exposures to blood or other potentially infectious materials could occur. The drastically reduced numbers of work-related hepatitis B and HIV infections in healthcare workers is a modern triumph of occupational medicine. Besides healthy workers, employers want productive workers, so occupational medicine providers are also becoming specialists in activities and programs that increase worker productivity. Most of us understand the concept of absenteeism. If you're not present at the workplace, you're usually not productive. But what if you're present at work, but not very productive? Presenteeism is a term used to describe a worker who is present at work, but is not fully functioning, and therefore has decreased productivity. Presenteeism problems occur when workers work with back pain, arthritis, heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, migraine headaches, or have the flu or colds. In addition, workers who die prematurely deprives the employer of extremely skilled and experienced workers. So keeping workers healthy means keeping workers productive, providing incentives for exercise, weight loss, stop smoking programs, and other health programs by employers have been shown to decrease both absenteeism and presenteeism. We don't only work with workers and companies. Our knowledge and skill in diagnosing and treating illnesses and injuries related to work exposures makes us the experts related to exposures outside the workplace, that is, in our living environment. Environmental medicine deals with the prevention and treatment of problems caused by chemical, biological, and physical factors in our living environment. Environmental medicine combines clinical, epidemiological, and toxicological approaches to help us understand causation, prevention, and elimination or control of non-work-related exposures. Rapid and uncontrolled industrialization can lead to contamination of our air, water, land, and sometimes our food. U.S. industries produce more than one ton of hazardous waste every year for each person living here. There are thousands of sites in the U.S. where hazardous waste has been dumped, discarded, or stored, whether legally or illegally. And it's not just a problem in the United States. In 1984, a disaster at a pesticide plant in Bhopal, India, released a cloud of methyl isocyanate gas into the environment that unfortunately killed over 2,000 people in the surrounding community. In 1986, a disaster at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in what is now Ukraine resulted in the acute deaths of over 50 people and an estimated 4,000 other deaths in the 600,000 people with high occupational and environmental exposures. In 1969, an oil rig blowout in the ocean near Santa Barbara, California resulted in a crude oil spill that released more than 200,000 gallons of oil, much of which washed ashore. This oil spill, which killed many seals, dolphins, birds, and other wildlife, was widely publicized. The public's outrage at this disaster contributed to the birth of the modern environmental movement and helped set the political stage for the creation of OSHA one year later. In 1979, a partial core meltdown of a nuclear generator at Three Mile Island, Pennsylvania, resulted in the release of radioactive gases into the environment. Fortunately, epidemiological studies have not found substantial health effects from this accident. In 2010, a blowout at the Deepwater Horizon oil rig killed 11 workers and released almost 5 million barrels of oil into the Gulf of Mexico. The spill also caused extensive damage to marine and wildlife environments and to the local fishing and tourism industries. And in 2011, an earthquake and tsunami in Japan caused a meltdown at the Fukushima nuclear power plant that released radioactive material into the environment. Though no immediate deaths due to radiation exposure occurred at the time of the incident, radiation released into the atmosphere contaminated farmland and water resulting in the closure of most nuclear power plants in Japan and could have long-term psychological effects on many people. 
These recent tragedies remind us of the disastrous consequences that chemical and physical hazards can have on workers, people, animals, and the environment. For most of us, however, environmental hazards are present not because we live near industrial plants, but because of exposures we might have where we live or go to school. Asbestos is present in many materials used in schools, hospitals, and houses, and continues to present a risk if not contained or if removed improperly. Lead-based paint was used extensively in houses built before 1940, and paint chips from degrading building materials may be eaten by young children resulting in lead toxicity. The use of leaded gasoline in cars has been phased out since the 1970s, and leaded gasoline is no longer legal for use in on-road vehicles in the United States. Radon, a radioactive, odorless, colorless gas, may be found in confined areas such as basements and houses and other buildings. Inhaled radon gas is a large contributor to an individual's background radiation exposure, and epidemiologic studies have shown a link between radon exposure and lung cancer. Environmental medicine also deals with exposures people may have due to indoor air quality. Mold and fungus can be present in high concentrations and cause significant allergic and other effects. Chemicals used in the production of carpets, furniture, and building materials may result in the release of noxious and irritant odors and gases, such as formaldehyde and other volatile organic compounds. Chemicals such as polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, pesticides, gasoline, and runoff from fertilizer or ground salt can contaminate groundwater, underground water, and aquifers. This could result in detectable levels of these contaminants in our home water, which can also contain high levels of lead due to degradation of lead pipes used to transport water. Studies have even found small amounts of PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, in snow, even in glaciers far away from industrial areas. And global warming, most likely caused by greenhouse gases produced by the burning of fossil fuels by humans, is another example of the effect that humans have on our living environment and, unfortunately, the effects that our environment may someday have on us. So let's finish the game and go over what we've learned. Occupational and environmental medicine is a unique and dynamic field. We prevent and treat work-related injuries and illnesses. We screen workers before they start and during the job to make sure the job isn't adversely affecting them. We try to keep people healthy on and off work. We help employers and employees follow federal and state government health requirements and regulations. We evaluate and manage disabled workers. And we help workers keep healthy by encouraging exercise, helping workers to lose weight, and stop smoking. We work in clinics. We visit workplaces. We work with physical therapists. We work in the environment. We sit at safety and other company meetings. And unfortunately, sometimes we work with lawyers all in order to help workers and people live healthier, longer, and more productive lives. If you'd like more information, please contact the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine at www.acoem.org.